The appearance of this giant, the Laterno Land Train, stunned the automotive world. Its size was incredible. This land train, with its diesel-electric transmission, easily traversed the snowy lands of Alaska. Why was this giant created? What role did the Cold War play here? Hold on tight. We're diving into the engineering world of Mr. Letourneau. With incredible design and a wide range of applications. Powerful, gigantic. They dug and transported, conquered the most impassable off-road terrain, and pushed through forests and deserts. These are the machines of Robert Gilmore Letourneau, an American engineer and inventor who, thanks to his revolutionary and innovative design ideas, created incredible vehicles that went beyond the existing classifications of the time and elevated the entire global automotive industry to a new level of quality. Our story begins in the early 1950s, when the Pentagon decided to create a special long-range early warning line to monitor the appearance of Soviet strategic bombers in the sky. This line consisted of a network of radar stations located along the northern Arctic coast of Canada and the northern coast of Alaska's Aleutian Islands. These radars were meant to detect approaching Soviet bombers in advance. Implementing such a large-scale project required significant organizational efforts, especially in terms of logistics. Delivering tens of thousands of tons of construction materials, equipment, and provisions to the Arctic desert region seemed like an impossible task. In this kingdom of ice and snow, there were no roads or railways at all. The existing airfields were also located far to the south. And access to land from the sea was blocked by thick ice that gripped the coastline. So the transport company Alaska Freight Lines, which had received a contract from the Pentagon to deliver the cargo, faced a serious challenge. To reach the site where the radar stations were to be built, there was a truly difficult task to cover a 600-kilometer distance across a snow-covered Arctic desert. So, in order not to waste time, they immediately began searching for a company that would agree to build a special all-terrain vehicle with sufficient cargo capacity. However, finding such a company was very difficult, and it was unclear how long this search would have lasted. If it hadn't been for one of the managers at Alaska Freight Lines, who remembered an interesting event he had witnessed in a Texas town, where an enormous and unusually designed tractor drove down the main street like in a parade, towing behind its seven-wheeled platforms loaded with logs. That was the VC-12 Tuna Train All-Terrain Tractor, developed by RG Le Tourneau Incorporated. Which company? In 1929, in the city of Stockton, California, it was founded by the talented mechanical engineer and inventor Robert Gilmore. The main activity of this company was the development and production of earth-moving equipment. It all started with ordinary Fresno-type toad scrapers, which could be pulled by either horses or track bulldozers. But for the talented mechanic and inventor Letourneau, that just wasn't enough. He began conducting his own experiments with machinery. As a result, revolutionary scrapers with articulated frames were built. And something new. At that time, vehicles were being built with diesel-electric transmissions, which were similar to those used in railway locomotives. Operating principle. This kind of machinery demonstrated much greater work efficiency, maneuverability, and productivity than the existing models. At that time, there were similar models. In the 1930s, Letourneau scrapers were not yet involved in all major hydroelectric construction projects, including the Hoover Dam. Large government construction projects in the early 1930s only increased. The demand for scrapers. Robert Letourneau's business was growing rapidly. From the mid-1930s to the early 1940s, factories were opened in Peoria, Illinois, Tacoa, Georgia, Rydelmere, Australia, Vicksburg, Mississippi, and Longview, Texas. Such innovative equipment quickly caught the attention of the military, which began purchasing them in large quantities for its various military units. During World War II, about 75% of the earth-moving machines used by the Allied forces of the anti-Hitler coalition were manufactured by Le Tourneau. These included not only scrapers, which were the company's main product, but also unique, never-before-seen machines designed to perform a variety of tasks. In 1943, special multipurpose machines were developed under Le Tourneau's leadership. 
The Turnipole series included the all-terrain Turnitractor, which was equipped with a diesel engine producing 275 horsepower. This tractor operated in tandem with a variety of towed implements. In 1944, the experimental 40-ton TI-4 transporter was delivered to the Army. It consisted of two single-axle tractors equipped with 220 horsepower Cadillac engines, between which a platform was suspended for transporting main M4 tanks. A new era began for the Stockton-based company in the early 1950s, when the American company Westinghouse acquired a controlling stake in Letourneau on May 1, 1953. This led to the creation of a new joint venture, Letourneau Westinghouse. The new influx of investment helped the company continue its experiments with electric transmission, which resulted in the creation of incredible vehicles, such as a snowmobile and a tractor. The Snow Buggy TC-264, with a total weight of 21 tons, was developed to serve as a U.S. military base in Antarctica. The next in line among these innovative models was the previously mentioned VC-12 Turnatrain logging tractor, which, however, never found a buyer but managed to attract the attention of a transportation company from Alaska with its unusual appearance. They were in urgent need of such vehicles to deliver half a thousand tons of cargo beyond the Arctic Circle, where a network of radar stations was being built. On January 5, 1954, Alaska Freight Lines signed a contract with Westinghouse to build an all-terrain tractor. The VC-22 Snow Freighter, which was an enlarged and improved copy of the VC-12, Thanks to the ready-made design solutions from the previous machine, work on the new assembly all-terrain vehicle progressed at lightning speed. By February 17, 1954, the assembly of the vehicle was completed, and on February 21, it was sent to Alaska. The Snow Freighter consisted of a tractor unit equipped with two 12-cylinder Cummins diesel engines, each producing 400 horsepower. Each engine was used to drive generators that produced electricity for 24 electric motors which were installed on each of the wheels of the tractor and trailers. In total, the road train included five four-wheel trailers, each with a load capacity of 30 tons. Thus, the total load capacity of the entire road train reached an impressive 150 tons, with an overall length of 84 meters. The first trip of this giant, which took place in the fall of 1954 when Alaska freight lines began its 600-kilometer journey north from Fairbanks, Alaska, toward the Arctic Ocean was a success. But during the second journey, which took place a year later, a fire broke out in the snow freighter's engine compartment, completely disabling the entire vehicle. After that, it was taken out of service. Today, this machine stands abandoned by the highway, somewhere in Fox, Alaska. Such road trains attracted the interest not only of the transport company, but also of the military who already had experience operating the snow buggy all-terrain vehicle. At the end of 1953, they approached the company with an interesting proposal to combine the features of the snow buggy and the turner train in a new vehicle. Thus, in January 1956, a vehicle called the Logistic Cargo Carrier, or LCC-1 for short, was created at the Longview plant in Texas. It combined the wheels of the snow buggy with the power system of the turner train. The composition of this vehicle included a two-axle locomotive tractor and three two-axle trailers. All the wheels of the road train were equipped with their own electric motor. At the front of the tractor, there was a cab for the driver and three crew members. Behind it was the engine compartment with a 600-horsepower diesel engine, generators, and a fuel tank. The cab also had a rear electric-powered crane. After a series of factory tests, the vehicle was handed over to the Army in March 1956 where it continued to undergo testing at a military training ground. After being adopted into service, the road train was sent to Greenland. A little later, it began performing transport missions in the northern regions of Alaska, where it made its final run in 1962. After that, it was simply abandoned in a junkyard right behind Fort Wainwright military base in Alaska. Later, it was moved to the Yukon Transportation Museum in Whitehorse. The military liked the concept of an all-terrain land train so much that in 1958 the Army signed a contract to build a larger version, the TC-497 Overland Train Mark II. This was a true giant, born out of the paranoia of the 1950s about a possible nuclear apocalypse. According to the Pentagon's plan, 
This incredible all-terrain land train was supposed to travel across complete wilderness after nuclear bombings and the destruction of highway and railway transport hubs, serving as the last hope for logistics. It would connect the isolated islands of civilization of those who survived. In this way, the overland train could easily fit into the list of post-apocalyptic vehicles from the famous Hollywood franchise. The new land train from Laterno received significant technical upgrades. Instead of the 600 horsepower Cummins engine, the vehicle was equipped with four gas turbines. Saturn 10 MC power units from solar turbines, each with 1,170 horsepower. One of them was installed directly in the tractor, while the other three, mounted in separate trailers, could be positioned anywhere along the land train. As for the tractor, it had a three-axle configuration and a new, spacious cab. It was located at the front of the vehicle, six meters above the ground, and resembled a ship's captain's bridge. The relatively compact gas turbine engine made it possible to create enough free space in the locomotive to accommodate six people. The crew had sleeping berths, a toilet, and a galley. There was even a radar installed on the roof of the cab, intended to assist this land dock, so it wouldn't get lost in the endless expanses of the post-apocalyptic desert. The locomotive tractor towed ten freight cars behind it, and two additional cars with engines. Both the tractor and the cars were equipped with special wheels with low-pressure tires, each 3.5 meters in diameter. The total length of the road train reached an incredible 180 meters. On flat terrain, the overland train could carry 150 tons of cargo at a maximum speed of about 30 kilometers per hour. Its range when fully loaded was between 560 and 640 kilometers. To increase its range, the road train could be equipped with an additional fuel wagon. To reduce the curb weight, all parts of the vehicle were made from welded aluminum. Even during the design phase, the land train engineers faced an extremely challenging task. How do you give a road train of such incredible length the necessary control and maneuverability? Any shock turn was bound to cause chaotic movements of the wagons. The solution developed at Lacterneau was quite original and innovative. It consisted of creating a special electrical system that synchronized the turning of the wheels, forcing the entire road train to move along a single track, even when driving off-road. Work on building the Laterneau train continued until the end of 1961 after which the machine was handed over to the Army in February 1962 and sent to the Yuma Proving Ground in Arizona for testing. Overall, the tests were quite successful. The road train demonstrated decent driving and transport capabilities, but no further steps were taken to adopt this machine into service. Work on the project was discontinued. One of the reasons for this decision was the introduction of new heavy transport helicopters in the U.S. Army, such as the Sikorsky S-64 Sky Crane, which rendered the concept of land-based wheeled megatrains obsolete. For some time, the land train remained abandoned. But already in 1969, the longest road train in the world was put up for sale for $1.4 million. However, due to the lack of buyers, it remained unsold, left to rust in its parking spot. As of today, all that remains of the giant is the tractor, which is located at the Yuma Proving Ground Heritage Center. The rest was sold to a local scrap metal dealer. The development of unusual vehicles by Laterno was by no means limited to just giant land trains. At the same time, the company developed vehicles that were somewhat smaller in size, but no less impressive in terms of bold engineering ideas. Machines for the military. Among them were mini-trailers, mine-clearing vehicles, tower cranes, and drilling rigs. In 1956, the company completed the construction of two 600-horsepower airfield recovery vehicles. Crash Pusher 6x6, each weighing 67 tons. With the help of their blades, these two giants could quickly clear the runway of damaged heavy bombers. One of the largest single transport vehicles in the world became the savior of landing craft. The LCR landing craft retriever, measuring 22 and a half meters long and weighing 100 tons. It was a giant, a U-shaped tubular structure on four drive wheels, under which a landing craft could be suspended and evacuated. A damaged landing craft on the shore. On the front crossbeam of this machine, two diesel engines with 230 horsepower each and a generator station were installed. The most impressive creation of the 1960s by the Letourneau company was the giant tactical amphibious crusher, the Letro Crusher, 
weighing 95 tons, which was used by the American military to clear paths through the dense jungles of Vietnam. The machine was built in two units in 1967. At the core of this all-terrain vehicle was a sturdy backbone frame, to the front and rear of which three drive units were attached. Hollow steel drums, each 3.7 meters in diameter, with sharp cutting edges, were designed both to shred wood and to provide the machine with buoyancy. The single rear drum was steerable, while a sturdy crossbeam was attached in front of the two front drums, which was used for felling trees. An armored cab was installed on the Letourneau Crusher, and a 20-cylinder V-type Detroit diesel engine with a displacement of 14 liters and a power output of 475 horsepower, which drove a generator, and that, in turn, supplied electricity to three electric motors installed in each drum. On June 1, 1969, Robert Letourneau passed away, and already in the following year, 1970, Letourneau. Technology became part of the Marathon Manufacturing Company and practically ceased the development of new automotive equipment. And so, the era of unrestrained innovation and creative engineering by the talented Robert Gilmore Letourneau forever became one of the brightest chapters, not only in American history, but also in the history of the global automotive industry, a living testament to which are the giant road trains that still seem ready at any moment to step down from their museum pedestals and set off on another journey somewhere out there, far to the north. Where the lights of the aurora borealis shimmer so brightly. <laughs>